Howdy once again, it's Tubal Kane, your YouTube shop teacher, and this is episode number 46 of my This and That series. Welcome back to the shop. I have an awful lot to cover. This will be a long video. You can skip through it if you need to. There will be some viewer appreciation items, just general updates in what I'm doing, and uh, I think some interesting stuff. So uh, let's get started. Let's start out with a rhetorical question. What's with all the hair on my ears from that uh, previous video clip? Well, I here's why. Uh, in the last three months, I went through three barbers. My original barber, Willie, a uh, World War II veteran at the age of 93, finally uh, moved away to join his daughter. But uh, then another one that I had occasionally gone to retired, and then the third one, who I was going to start going to, disappeared. So. Went downtown the other day, and uh, this guy's too busy. I think he's a, there's only one barber in town. Men go to beauty shops. All right, off, that's off topic, but there has been some discussion lately about hexagon dyes. Now, this is a set of hexagon dyes that are re-threading dyes. That is, they're for thread repair, both coarse and fine. And there are many people that might tell you erroneously that in a set like this, which I paid $13 for 20 years ago, by the way. And some of these are not very good sets, but they're still not cheap because they're carbon steel. They're not high-speed steel. But there's the hexagon dies, and they are not meant for rethreading, although they certainly would work for that, but they're meant to be held in a die holder, which I... Where is a die holder? But these are just for general threading and tapping, so don't confuse them with re-threading dies. In a recent video, and I'll put the number up at the top so you can check it out if you haven't seen it already, on the Stanley number 84 blank blank job master bolt cutter, and that was a semi-popular video, and there'll be a follow-up on that in regards to bending with this. But I showed you some patent drawings, and the patent drawings were just uh, the basics, that is the concept of this entire thing. But the funny thing is that often after a video is over, people send me information and there's updates on that that I wish I had included in the first one, but it's information I didn't know at the time. So let me show you other patent drawings real quickly. There's a small group of people out here that really like these patent drawings, but there's the patent number, and this is assigned also to Stanley, but you can see they took the concept and made a finished tool out of it. There's two pages here. And here's page two, that's 1973, and there's the number again. And there's a lot of other information to read, but it's all legalese. But this particular drawing shows more on how to use the bender. And that's what I want to include in the next video. Notice the jaw swung out of the way, and there was some discussion on that as well. All right, that's enough on that. Watch for another video. If I may be serious for just a minute, from time to time I get troublesome comments that uh, to me are hurtful, but th people say that I never mention anything kindly about my students. It's always negative or derogatory. Well, the reason for that is because the funny stories uh, really revolve around that type of student or uh, various incidents that happened and are memorable over the years. They weren't funny at the time, but they certainly are funny now. But 98% of my students were wonderful people. Many of them grew up to have long lives in shops as machinists and other uh, people in the trade. I see many of them often on the street or in stores and places like that and still have a good relationship with them. But I just returned from church and our guest speaker today was a man by the name of Bill Allison, a former student. He didn't go into the trades, he went into the ministry, went to Bible school. He's a gifted speaker, much in demand in central Illinois, speaking in uh, churches and camps and seminars and uh, various things like that. And uh, He was the speaker this morning and uh, I had my picture taken with him just a few minutes ago. And I just wanted to say something nice about him and nice about my students. And uh, he's 
I'll show the still here in just a second, and he's pointing like this, and you know, he's saying Tubal Cain, and uh, he's watched some of my videos and gets a kick out of that. So let's take a look at Bill Allison, wonderful Christian man, family man, husband, and uh, uh, bound for heaven. So it was good to see you, Bill. Take a look at this picture, and then on with the video. This was in a very recent video, What Is It?, and again, I obtained much more information in Part 2 than I had in Part 1, and then it was too late to include it, so there'll be a follow-up video on this, on how to use it, and there's what the clamps look like, and that was all shown in the patent drawings, which you'll see here in just a second, but watch for the follow-up on this as well. And this was from 1959, and we had all kinds of crazy guesses, there's the patent number, on what this thing is, but it truly is a method of applying wire clamps to hoses, regardless of what some people said, and they said put it in a hardy hole. No, there's a clamp base that came with it, long gone, but of course that square part could be held in a vise. There it is with the clamp, that is the wire clamp, in place. And several people sent that patent number to me. Thank you guys for doing that. Read through the comments on these videos. You'll find startling and very informative things. And there is the wire clamp. I don't know if they sold those as, or as preforms, but I'm going to make my own out of baling wire. Now, I've already made two videos on the Bernard pliers, but there's going to be a third one. Don't watch it if you're sick of the subject. But my buddy Gary was over yesterday, and look what he brought me. And in here, is, there's a whole box of pliers. Included are about five or six or seven Bernard-type pliers, special purpose. So I'll cover that in the next video. And then there's also about six or eight pliers in here that are very special pliers that I'm going to include in my what is it so uh, watch out for those videos and thanks to Gary for all of that and everybody else that is contributing to the good of the cause now some of you may not realize this if you're not a YouTube creator but you can't really go into the videos and edit them after they're done well, somebody pointed out that I had duplicate numbers, so I'm making a correction here. So these two videos here, which you may have watched, 526 and 527, are renumbered and will appear under these numbers here in italics. So don't watch those videos if you've already seen them, because they are the same videos, just renumbered, but you will probably get a notification that there's a new video on. So. So watch for that. And I don't know why YouTube took away that feature. And they did that quite a while ago. It's, it's nothing new, but I suffer from that because I'm not able to edit and change, a mis fix mistakes and add information other than down in the description. So always check the description as well. Three days ago, I went down to Ace Hardware to buy wire and plugs so that I could could put a three wire grounded system on my South Bend shaper, which there'll be videos on that coming pretty soon. But I kind of balked because it was, it was $8 for a plug like this. And uh, they were out of the cable that I wanted, the rubber cable. And I, I actually kind of scolded three different clerks who tried to find it. I said, that's got to be the most common wire that you sell by the foot. You know, why don't you have that? There was no expo. Oh, we'll order it. We'll order it. But you know how that goes. All right, but so I come home, and in the mail, there's a priority box here from uh, my buddy David Alley, who's up uh, in Michigan. Remember, he runs that safety company. He was here for my meet and greet. But in the box here, there were, I already used one, one plug. Uh, one, two, three, four, five or six of these, you know, brand new plugs, and you could even make an extension cord with these. And these are the type of plug that allows you to clamp the wire, not wrap the wire and have it all frizzy and fraying around the screw. So I really like these things, and thanks, David, for that. You know, that's $50 worth. Now, you'll find this humorous if it's not pathetic, but back to Bernard Pliers. 
Joe Heilman said, I'm going to send you a couple pairs of pliers, you know, so uh, watch for those. So, all right, this comes in the mail after a week or two, and when I get it, it's, it says resealed or something. I thought, well, no problem, and I, because I hope nothing's missing, so I dump it out, and there's two pair of Bernard pliers. Now, uh, I'll give you his name because he's... Uh, he redid this pliers in one of his videos here, and, and then this is another Bernard there. We don't know the purpose of it. I think it might be to cut nail. It cuts my nails. It, maybe it's to cut dog nails or something. I, I, I really don't know exactly what it is. So I went up to thank him on my computer, and here's what happened. His channel is called Joe Shop. Now watch the video called A Gift for a Fellow YouTuber because he's talking about me. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll take a look at that video. And I did. And then in the video, stand by. So in the video, he makes it very clear that he sent me three, not two, pliers. And the middle one there, which is the best one because these other two aren't all that great, that is the one that's missing. That one there is missing. So our great postal system does it again. But thank you, Joe, for that. And I think he's got another one he's going to send me to replace that. But I like these little ones. See, I didn't have any of that size. This one has been sandblasted and redone, but it, it's, it's not in real good shape. The real good one is... Uh, on a postal sorting floor someplace in Timbuktu. Let me talk just a little bit about these black books again. Mr. Rain Rapp, who I have not met, but yet I've contacted him many times, and he supplied about 40 of these books that I gave away at my meet and greet, and he's got a new product here that I want to talk about, but there's the information. He's a sales support man for high-impact distributors of the Black Book. There's all the information, but there's also a website that you can go to and have a look. Now, all of these books are what you'd call pocket size. They're real handy, and this is the engineer's one here that is probably the most useful for machinists, but there's the uh, black book here for electrical and for fasteners. But let's just talk about this one for a moment, because recently they came out with a larger edition, won't fit in your pocket, and he just sent me a sample copy, so they now have those available if you're interested. But I also wanted to tell you that they're coming out with a special edition that will be at the bash available at the bash and all of the creators including myself will have a promotion on this and there'll be a different cover for this promotion and so watch for that and those will be available at the bash as well as from the different uh, channels of the creator so it's really exactly the same inside it's just larger and uh, easier to read for old people like me. It starts out with some historical stuff, which interests me greatly, because I like the history of technology, so there's several pages on that. And then all of the usual information inside that is so handy for the home shop machinists. Thank you to Jerry Wilson, who sent me a care package here the other day. And in fact, it was yesterday. And in there is the blasters book, so I, I think people think I'm a blaster now because I had that fuse cutter. Remember that? In a, so here's all kinds of information on how to use blasting powder and dynamite and other explosives to... Uh, this would be the anarchist's handbook, I guess. So thanks for that, Jerry. Now, I'm not going to hardly show that to you because there's a Bernard item that's going to appear in what is it? Here is a special micrometer that will appear in, uh, what is it? And he also sent me a Sterrett sheet metal or wire gauge. And uh, you'll, you'll see some more of this. It's kind of pitted on the one side, but yet it'll still be useful. And it's a number, eight, uh, what is it, 281 American Standard wire gauge. Thank you, Jerry, for those goodies. And you'll see some of these in future videos. 
Yesterday I visited my brother-in-law and he worked at Caterpillar forever and been retired now for quite a while but he's cleaning things up and he had given me some other machinist tools but there's a Mitutoyu metric 25 millimeter but as usual with any of the older Mitutoyu the foam lining this was lined with some kind of plastic foam disintegrated turned to powder and it, then it sticks. Now whether or not this will clean up, I don't know, but the, you see how that gets into the neural. And these have his initials on them, but at uh, Caterpillar, that was clearly marked that this doesn't really count. You've got to use our instruments and our gauging. You can use this just to get close, but you aren't using this for the final measurement. They were really fussy. I worked in that same plant for a year. And then uh, here, this is kind of well, not beat up, but it's just had a lot of use. There's a one-incher. I don't know what happened there. And Phil's name is on the back. And I don't know why this isn't there, but there's a one-inch standard. Unless he was also using this to check it when it was at the maximum. Generally, we use these with two-inch micrometers, but I don't know why that's in there. Dilapidated case, but in here... There are some drill gauges, but those are just the cheap giveaway plastic. I don't like those. Some sterile charts and some Caterpillar information there on conversions. And this he must have had in his toolbox. This is kind of handy the way this is written up here to find the speed that you should run drill bits at. RPM and cutting feet per minute all the way up to one and three quarter and some formulas and speeds for cast iron steel and malleable also in here he ran a lot of grinding machines so this stare at satin chrome is pretty rough I think those are grinding pits which won't come out so not real good and then in here there's also some V blocks, and I believe those are shop made. There's a pair of those and a bigger fixture here of some kind. Why he has a little pin vise, I can't read that whether that's sterile or not. It's so doggone small. And finally, yeah, another one of those, and that's about it. Now I gotta take a look, but I think this is a stop for a 5C collet. And you know what? It is indeed a stop for a 5C collet. I don't have one of those, believe it or not, so that might come in handy at some point. Now not all 5C collets have a thread inside. But for those that do, that'll work nicely. That's a genuine hardinge, which are coveted by most machinists. I don't have many that are hard. Thank you, Phil, so much for these items to add to my arsenal here. In a very recent video, I made a shoulder bolt that would hold this vise onto the South Bend Shaper, if you recall, or you saw that one. Well, there was one little problem, and that is that I made a slotted screw, and there just is no good way to hold the screwdriver in there. So I went back with a pin. You see how there's a hole in there? And that was shown on the original drawing. I was trying to get away from that because it was kind of an intricate thing to do. But now the head of the bolt is pinned and will not turn when I tighten the nut from below to lock the vise down. A lot of people are complaining about the advertisements and commercials on YouTube. Remember that the creators have absolutely nothing to do with that. We have no control over that. I don't even know what kind of ads appear. And uh, that's what drives the entire YouTube and Google machinery is the money that is generated from these ads. So they are necessary. But you can avoid them, and you can avoid them by paying $10 a month for YouTube Premium. It used to be called YouTube Red. That's what I use because I watch very little broadcast television. I watch YouTube, and I don't have to watch any ads at all because of this. So it is so well worth it. I don't care if you get it or not. I'm just explaining this to you that it's really a wonderful thing to to avoid advertisements uh, on 
but you are certainly watching a lot of it if you watch commercial television and people don't really complain about that and that's all you get is ads. So uh, let me show you here real quickly on my phone what it looks like if you pay that $10 a month. This is what will appear on your screen whether it be your phone or other device it'll just say premium up there and that, that means I paid 10 bucks to not see any ad. Now in the last issue of this and that I ran out of time so I'm going to put on a short clip here about stera tools and a few interesting things so watch that and this is information that other people gave me. I simply have to tell this story. Very recently someone told me they had been through the steric plant and had a, a beautiful uh, tour of the plant and upon leaving uh, the the man, the tour director, asked this guy, he said, how many uh, Stera tools do you buy? Are you a regular customer of ours? And upon thinking, he was said to himself, or maybe even admitted to this man that, you know, I really don't ever buy Stera tools. No, I, I get them at auctions or wherever. And uh, the man said that the biggest competition that they have is their own tools which seem to last forever and then I pondered this and thought that really I haven't bought a brand new stero tool in the box from a supplier in I don't know how long 30 or 40 years I did buy lots lots of them when I was at the high school for the school but I guess I really never buy them myself and that hurts a big company like this that, that needs to have constant sales so I felt quite bad about that and I need to buy some brand new stereo tools but I really don't need any. If I may continue to talk about stereo just a little bit this is a picture of the Sterrett book called the Sterrett Story and they used to hand these out free and I would get them at the high school but really that's not something kids want to hear about but I would read this book myself and enjoyed it and here's just a little bit uh, newer version of it I haven't uh, ever read this I don't know if it's any different than the previous one but that brings me to another story here just the other day I received an email from Scott Anderson and he lives up near Fargo, Dakota Territory and he said take a look at this. So here's a good current uh, account of the Sterrett Company and it's on the internet. I'll put the link on the screen or below in the description. You might enjoy reading this. It is fairly long but yet it's uh, something that is uh, real interesting about some of their financial uh, plates. Quite some time ago I visited that screw machine factory and made a video of that and he's up in Rockford. He sent me some updated information on a video clip so let's take a look at that. Some time ago I made a video and here it is a field trip to a screw factory that's up in Rockford. Well the owner Josh Clark recently sent me some more footage of a little project or a little job they did up there so let's take a look at that and thank you Josh. time ago someone told me uh, how to go about making a poor man's wiggler so I made a video of that uh, several clips now in one of them I use uh, just a common stick pin and it isn't running as true as I thought you know these things show up better on my big video screen than they do when I'm filming it so I wasn't right on on that but and the pin might have been bent but then I do another method using a stair scriber so Let's have a look at that. From time to time you see me use a wiggler and although it's not a particularly expensive tool there is a 
there are a couple substitutes for this and quite a while ago a viewer by the name of Cosmic Ray Astrophysics said you know uh, when I was in college at Oxford we were taught to use what they call the poor man's wiggler so let me show you how to use that and thanks for that Cosmic but this type of poor man wiggler is nothing more than a little straight pin that has the plastic head on it and if you would put that into your Jacob's chuck your drill chuck and just tighten it snug it up with your hands do not use the key because it needs to be able to move around like that and then with the machine turned on simply take a chuck key handle or something like that doesn't matter and you can quickly true it up and you're ready to find your layout line try to get a pin that is straight and not bent and it has been suggested to use modeling clay such as this and I'm using an end mill it's got to be a four fluter that has a little bit of a, a center hole in it and the pin can be held into that so and there's probably other materials perhaps wax that you could use for that similarly and much more recently John Creasy made a suggestion that take your stare at combination square and pull out the little scriber and you can use that as a wiggler now these might vary just a little bit in diameter and they have a bit of a knurl on them so I found that they work better in a 3 8 collet they're about 3 8 and again the collet has to be a little bit loose don't don't snug it up just uh, just use your fingers and that works better than trying to hold this in a Jacob's chuck if uh, when you go to center this in a Jacob's chuck or even the collet for that matter it may drop out on you and here it is and it quickly straightens up and would work very well as a poor man's wiggler and while I'm still at my bridge port let me zoom in on something here I've had I don't know how many comments over the years saying how did you ever crack that huge casting on your bridge port mill and it does look like a crack at first uh, glance doesn't it but it is simply a bad chip in the paint you know this isn't just paint that they use on these machines they use a filler almost like a, a body filler to smooth out the castings and that's been scraped by a high school student 40 years before I bought it. Thank you for watching this video that ran way, way longer than I expected, but I think I'm updated and uh, out of information now. Uh, several things. One thing is that I do now have t-shirts available, so watch the description of my videos, and that's probably where I'll give information on that. So. Keep watching for a lot of videos that are coming out as I get back into the warmer weather and I'm able to get into the foundry and start videos on that closing horizontal mill and that beautiful little South Bend Shaper. There will be a lot of videos coming up in the summer. I hope that people watch them, but I, there's a tendency for people to be outdoors rather than at their computers. I understand that, so watch them all in the fall uh, go back and look at my videos because I'm cranking out about two or three sometimes even four weeks so there's a lot out there thank you so much for watching and supporting my channel this is Tubalcane your YouTube doc shop, your YouTube shop teacher saying so long for now this is a teaser for an item that will appear in my what is it video very soon so what is that thing I never knew